Welcome to Men Heard 2, brought to you by hashtag Coffee with Tea, a place where men get to share their truth. So for years, we've been trying to figure men out, and we get together as women, as communities, and we talk amongst ourselves. So I thought to myself, after having three sons, what better way to figure men out or to get information about men than for men? So we are here today, and I am very, very excited about this guest this morning because he's known me and I've known him for probably 40 years, close to 40 years, which, listen, I'm telling somebody's age, but it's okay. So today I have with me Robert Harris, better known as Buddy, a man of God, married for 31 years, father of two girls, law enforcement officer for 25 years, Montclair PD, six years, and Essex County Prosecutor's Office, 19 years, leader in the church for 10 years, brother of a slain sister, president and CEO of the Kingdom Group, which is a real estate investment company. They have a construction company, a photography company, and a home staging company. Welcome, 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 Robert. Or is it okay if I call you buddy? Absolutely. Buddy is fine. How are you this morning, Tracy? I Oh, <laughs> you know everybody calls me Trey. But yeah, it's okay. I know. When you know people for 40 years, you know, it's if you call me Tracy, you really know me. Yeah. Like you really know me. So welcome. So usually the first thing I ask my guests, my men, all is about the blueprint, about their relationship with their mother and father. But since I'm here with you, and listen, when I got a prayer warrior in the building, I get my prayer in. So would you start us off in prayer? Absolutely. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this glorious time that you have brought us here together. We're not just me and Trey, but our fa fa Facebook family, our brothers and our sisters that really need you right now. We're struggling in relationship. We're struggling in marriages. We're struggling in life. We're struggling with dealing with this pandemic, Father. So we just thank you for just showering your love and your blessings upon us. Father, we also ask that whoever cannot be reached through this message, we ask that you touch, touch their lives in a way that only you can. Let us get out the way and you intervene and you deal with the struggles that they're going through on a day-to-day -day basis, Father. But we thank you for your son. We thank you for his gift of life, not death, Father, for the gift of life for us and through us that we could just be closer to you and give you all the glory and all the honor that you deserve. So it's in your son, Yeshua's precious name that I come to you in prayer, Father. And we thank you for his sacrifice and we thank you for giving it to us life abundantly, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, I, I move with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, listen, buddy could pray. Like, I need my prayer because like you said, we are going through some crazy times right now. And if this touches one person, we've done what God called us to do. So amen. let me start off by asking you again about your blueprint. Tell us, tell me a little bit about a little bit about your relationship with your mother and a little bit about your relationship with your father. Sure. So um, in the hood growing up in Orange, which, which we say was the hood, it really wasn't. Um, I was very unique because I had both of my mother and my father in the home for my entire life. And um, I had a great re relationship with both of them. My father taught me so much. He showed me how to be a man. He took me to, to the tailor in West Orange and he put me in suits early. So he gave me a blueprint to how to be a man, but not how to be a father. You know, it was oh. different, you know, because fatherhood didn't come, you know, that easy because just, you know, not knowing how to really push that into you. He said, all right, this is the way to be a man, but he really never explained how to be a father until later on. And I'll get to that. Now, my mother, my mother was a um, teacher's aide in Lincoln Avenue School, so she was big on education. Um, and then she became a teacher later on, but then she later quit. And then she um, stayed at home. She started up her own daycare business. So I had um, a very great relationship with both my parents, both in the home. I had a great sister and um, who was also in the home. So we had a very great family dynamic growing up. So that blueprint was solid from the beginning. I had a great foundation, which helped me get through a lot of the things that I got through later on in life. Mm, I love it. See, because sometimes we don't understand how to deal with a man because we don't know what his blueprint is. So there's a lot of us, and, and I'm not just talking about personal intimate relationships. 
I'm talking about there's a lot of us who struggle to uh, communicate well with men because we don't know their blueprint. So I'm always curious to know the blueprint of a man from every guest going down. There was something that I learned like, oh, that's why this person operates this way. So, so, so let me to, go ahead. So stop you for a second. So mm -hmm. one of the things that we have to get past is our physical, what we could see in a relationship. Oh. There's generations of issues that we bring to the table in a relationship, generational. It's not just your parents, it's your grandparents and their great grandparents. It's four generations of issues that we have in us. So we're talking about my great grandfather, I'm dealing with my great grandfather's issues, hmm. you know? And my grandchildren will have to deal with my issues. And that's just the way life is. But we don't know that because what happens is we don't study anything. Oh. You know, men, especially, we don't open up the book. We don't open up books. And if you, and you know, people say, if you want to hide something, put it in a book because we don't read. We have to do more uh, with reading and studying and understanding who we are. God reveals everything to us. So if we do take the first step, he'll just show us everything. You know, I have a shirt on that says, open up your mind today. Yes. And that's what we really need to do. Mm, you can just leave now. You know what? <laughs> See, you can just drop the mic and walk out the room. You just explained a whole lot from, from this. And this is what I want people to understand from a male perspective, what is really going on. And our topic today, if you just tuned in, you are tuned into Men Her Too. Our guest today is Robert Buddy Harris. And our topic today is understanding the layers of a man. Are men complicated or simply misunderstood? So let's peel back some of the layers. So let's talk about loss and grief. So we know that you tragically lost your sister. So walk us through that journey because people think that men are, you know, women, we lose somebody, we all over, we cry and we get to express ourselves, but men are supposed to be at the funeral. Like I'm here and everything's okay. Talk about that journey of losing your sister. If you want to share a little bit of what happened and how that affected you. So I share this testimony all the time because I can always help somebody if they're going through a situation. It's, it's not going to help me or help anybody else if I keep what happened to this beautiful flower inside. She had three beautiful children, which I call my children now. So I really, I have five children and, and six grandkids. But what happened was she was in a relationship. She was married for probably about 15 years. She was in a domestic dispute with her husband and she was murdered. Not, you know, this, when I say murdered, it's a little different, somebody getting killed and then somebody being murdered. You know, it's a little difference behind the actions. You can kill somebody by running them over with a car by accident, or you can murder somebody that's intentional. Oh. And this act was intentional, which just drove a wedge between the family, his family, which we which were, we were really close and my family, but she was missing for almost a year, which oh. really devastated my parents. So um, she was buried and and uh, she was murdered and buried and hidden for for 11 months. So we finally was able to track her body down and we were able to recover her remains and we had at least could put my put her to rest and we had some closure. Well, let me let me back that up. My parents had closure. I didn't have closure. Oh because you know, I was at the time I was probably six years into my law enforcement career and I was a detective and I, I needed answers, you know, and that's just the way the mind works. And because I didn't have the answers that I needed, it just didn't end there for me. So the pressure, the guilt, the hurt, as you say, men hurt too, we hurt. We just don't know how to express our hurt sometimes. And the people that are closest to us usually get the brunt of our feelings. So what we need, what we need to do is we need to channel that hurt in a different direction. How do we do that? We need to call on our father. A lot of men don't have their fathers. So what do we do? We go out and we, we cheat, 
We mm. do alcohol. We do drugs. We do these things that come natural in the physical because we could see them as tangible. But what, what we don't understand is our Heavenly Father, and I don't want to get all churchy, but this is Please who do. I am. Please. You know, but, but this is who I am. This is who God made me, and he, under, he gave me the understanding that if we go to him and rely on him for everything, he can satisfy all of our needs. He can quench all of those insecurities and, and all of these things that we have about ourselves. He could take care of it all. So that's one of the beauties about him, and that's what I had to learn. And that was a part of the journey with the death, the death of my sister, you know. And I became the rock of the family at that time because my father thought that, you know, he did a um, disservice to our family from letting him, my sister marry this man, wow. which was a good man at one point, you know? I mean, people start off one way and then they get influenced by outside things and then they, they, they change. But um, how I really, really got through that time was when my mother asked me, she said, please, please do me a favor. She said, you got to promise me. And I said, what, Ma? She said, you cannot do anything to him. Your life is more important to this family than you getting revenge. So every time I had an opportunity to seek revenge, which a person would do, because again, I'm a cop. I'm yeah. a detective now. I've investigated several homicides and suicides in my mind. I could do whatever I wanted to do. In the natural, I could do whatever I wanted to do. But each and every time I heard my mother saying, do not do anything because your life is more important to this family. And she was totally right because I actually have, like I said, all five kids now, grandkids that come to my house. We're like grandma and grandpa, which if I had to did something, who knows where my life would be right now and the life of my family, my immediate family and my extended family. Right. And you, and we talk about, you know, you being a, and law enforcement and somebody murdering your sister. So many men are programmed to be protectors. And you talked about guilt. Why was there a level of guilt for you when it was beyond your control? Well, at the time I didn't know. You know, now I do because now I realize that we don't belong to each other. Oh. You know, the word says if if you love your, your daughter, your wife, your, your, your family more than you love me, talking about our Heavenly Father, then you're not worthy of me. But at the time, I didn't know because even though my father was in the church, he didn't really come home and teach us the way that he was learning. So he received it for himself, but he didn't pour it into us. He said, you know, you got to be good. You got to do these things. You got to get a job. But he didn't say, he didn't teach us the word. Right. You know, which is wow. different from, you know, back in the ancient times. And, and you saw I had my shirt on. I said it's a Yah thing. Some people won't understand because you, in the old times when we didn't call God, God, we call him Yahweh. Um, there was a level of you teach your family everything that there is to know about God, tr the traditions and what's coming up in the future, because the Torah taught us that, you know. Right. And when I say us, I mean it because we are the people of the Bible. We are the, but that's another topic. So my father didn't teach me those things. So when, so I felt guilty because here I am, this, this big brawny detective, Montclair, standout, got all these awards and everything. And I couldn't even protect my sister. That mm. was the guilt that I felt, which was, which was horrifying for me because I always prided myself on being able to take care of my family and take care of my family financially, physically and financially. I, was, I always prided myself on that. Find out later on that pride is something that God despises. So that's the reason why I had a lot of guilt with that situation and being in law enforcement, because I helped so many other people, but I couldn't even help my sister in this, in this case. Wow. So men, you said... There's two things that I thrived on, and that was protecting my family and financially being able to take care of my family. What physically was, and financially. Physically and financially. What, and, and this is just from your perspective and your opinion, because of course we know, for everybody listening, of course we know that Buddy doesn't speak for every man in the world, but from his perspective, we are learning today. 
what goes through the mind of a man when he can't financially provide and can't protect because there's so many people who are wondering why men are acting out at home when, when he can't meet those needs and not because he doesn't want to because there's obstacles in the way, how does that affect him? It, it, it really degrades his manhood. Mm. So, so the first thing that happens is he gets an outside influence saying that he's not good enough. Mm -hmm. And then he comes home and he tries to cover up his insecurities and, and all of these things that's going on in the outside world. He brings it home and he doesn't really know how to articulate to his spouse, to his partner, to his, to his queen, how to, how, what happened and how everything is unfolded in front of him. So what happens is he throws little nuggets out there instead of really giving the whole big picture. And then what happens? She says, you're not good enough. I want you out of this house and blah, blah, blah. And then they start arguing. And then that, and then, you know, things happen from there. Right. So it, it, it starts at a level here and then it goes, you know, it just, it just escalates. And what happens is now alcohol is introduced because almost 90% of the homes or 95% of the homes in America have alcohol in it, whether they're drinking themselves or they're for company. So that's that first step. You, you start with alcohol. And then the next step might be drugs, smoking a little marijuana, and then it escalates. Or now the woman is aggravating you. So now you go seek somebody else who, who is not going to aggravate you. So now you, you introduce all of these other elements that is not, um, that shouldn't be in a home and is not right for the situation. Right. The situation calls on for you to be open and honest with your queen, tell her, explain to her so she could actually get on the same page with you because uh, uh, w women have wisdom. You know, that's in, in the, in the, in the uh, glories of heaven, wisdom was a woman. So why do you think women are so wise? You know, because that's where their expertise is. You know, we were hunters. We go out and we hunt. We go out there and we kill because that's where God has, that's the lane that God has us in. But when we need wisdom, we don't do that. We don't share with our partner. We don't ask. We're doing it a lot more now. Yes. Because we have the internet and we could, we could research and stuff like that. We need, we can see that, you know, we need our partner's influence and our queen's influence. But in the past, we didn't do it because we just thought that they weren't there for us. or they didn't, they couldn't understand what we were going through. And 90% of the women can't because right. we don't give it to them. We don't give it to them straight, you know, put the cards on the table and then they could actually read the cards, understand the cards, study the cards, and then they can come back with a solution. But most of the time we don't. And that's a part of our fault. But again, it's generational. Right. You know, the lack of communication is generational. My father came in, he said it was this way, and then that was the way it was. Until the point where my mother started saying, this is the way it's going to be. And then he says, okay, Janet, do whatever you want to do. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so that's the way life is sometimes. And we don't, we don't communicate well. Men are not good, good communicators anyway. Right. It's just, it's just in us, you know, we have to, things need to be pulled out, but once you start peeling back that onion, we can really understand each other and trust our partner. And then we could actually talk freely. Wow. Men, ladies, I want the ladies to just listen. Men are naturally not good communicators. And so many times, ladies, we make it about ourselves. It's, it's not about us. It's generational. Men have not been taught to communicate for years. I always say this, and I did it to my own sons. As a, and a lot of our black men are being raised by single mothers. To God be the glory, you have both parents, but the majority of us are being raised by single mothers. And single mothers are good for saying, "Be quiet because I said so." So mm -hmm. we are teaching our sons, "Be quiet because I said so." So when they become grown men. That little boy inside of them is still hearing, be quiet because I said so. So in order for me not to be confrontational with my, my mate, my mom's voice comes in my head and I'm just like, you know what? I don't even wanna deal with this because I've learned that from my oldest son. So he'll just not say anything. And I'm like, 
I'm talking to you. But then I think, and we're working on some things that this is the way I taught him how to communicate, to just be quiet because I said so. Absolutely. So, 100%. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. 100%. But right. you know what? It's bigger than our household. It's a big influence. It's agendas that's out there that says, I don't want the man in the home because if I have a strong king and a strong queen, they make strong princes and princesses. So what am I going to do? I'm going to introduce all of these other elements like um, Section 8, where you can't have a man in the house, um, welfare, where you can't have a man in the house. So now you, di- you, you, you take away the family element where we think that we're getting something, we're actually destroying ourselves. But it's an agenda to do it because you stick a kid in front of a TV and let the TV teach uh, uh, your child instead of you doing that for yourself. And you know, one of the things that I, t- I always tell my, my kids, I said, when y'all have children, I'm gonna take them for the first seven years because <laughs> I want them to understand everything because that's when they're sponges, you know? Yeah. And then I'll give them back to you because I want them to not only know about God first, but about life and, and forget that TV. The TV is a television, it's not a television. It's, it's nothing but lies. I, I've, you know, working in law enforcement, I see it firsthand, you know, how they have a picture on TV and I was there at the scene and it looks nothing like that, you know? So it's, it's all a big agenda, but that's, that's another um, podcast. <laughs> I love it. And let's transition over right from you speaking about your job to another layer of a man. So a man's profession. So I know you're in law enforcement and I've speak, spoken to a lot of wives who have not issues, but don't understand when their husband comes home and there's like a shutdown mode. I can't even imagine the things that people in law enforcement see, not only men, but women. Like I can't imagine, you know, normally we don't see their bodies. Like or homicide scene. So there's a, I mean, we see it on TV, law and order and all of that. How do you, or what should we know about men and women in law enforcement and and first responders that we're just not getting? Okay. It's one word, support. Okay. So what you really need to do is support whoever the spouse is, your partner is, because what happens is when you, when you deal with nothing but death and aggravation and politics and all of these things that are negative in your life, most of the time you bring that home and then you, you bring it out. And when you somebody, your kids might say, dad, how was your day? And all of a sudden, don't ask me about my day. You don't know what I've been through. I had to go to three murder scenes. I had to go to a car crash. I seen a little kid about your age hanging out the car. You know, and that little boy is like, wait, I just asked you how your day was, dad. You know, they don't realize, nobody really realizes unless you're in the profession, except for somebody in the military, what you go through on a daily basis. For, out of my 25 years, I've probably seen death 18 of those 25 years working directly with death, whether I was a homicide investigator, or whether I was in the crime scene unit, or I was in internal affairs. So dealing with that on a day-to-day basis, it's tough. And the biggest thing that you don't get is support, you know? Wow. So you're looking for a key word is support. Just support your, your person who is in that suit or that that um, that uniform. Even if, It could be a nurse. A lot of people don't realize people who are uh, women or men who are nurses, they deal with the same things or same uh, type of situations as we do. I was in the hospital all the time and you see the nurses, they're dealing with trauma patients and all of these things, not just the trauma patients. Now they're dealing with their families, just like we do, you know, all of these different things. So it's a, it's a unified um, profession, law enforcement, first responders, including the hospital workers and, and all these things. So uh, if you don't have a good family structure and the support of your family, it's not easy. That's why a lot of men and women in, in law enforcement and fire uh, firefighters and um, EMTs, they're, uh, a lot of them turn to alcohol because what happens is they don't get the support at home. So they go to the bar, the local bar, or they go to somebody's house and they, they drown their sorrows. But one of the good things was because I lived in Ocean County, 
my drive home was my decompression time. Oh, you know? okay. So, so if you need live, to get, if, so, the, so one of the things that you guys need, is it that you just need space before you, before the family comes and starts asking stuff? Do you just need to come in and just have some time to yourself? A hundred percent. You need decompression time. Just like um, men and women from that come home from the service, they need a time to transition back into the real world. We need that on a daily basis because wow. just think about it. You plan to go to your son's or your daughter's recital and you just had to zip up 10 kids that were in a car accident um, mm -hmm. around the same age as your kids. Before you go deal with your children, you need to decompress. But a lot of people don't. They 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 rush right home. They they get them a squig of liquor, and then they go off to the recital. And now they arguing on the way home because now you know it's just so much yeah. that you have to deal with in law enforcement that people don't really even understand. Now right. think about it. That's the average law enforcement officer. Now being a black police officer. I was going to go there. Was, it, it was even heightened, you know, because now you looked at, well, why are you doing this to me, brother? And I, I used to tell people, I'm not doing anything. You did it. You did it to yourself. But I didn't get into this profession to hurt you. You know, the Bible tells us blessed are the peacemakers. I got into this profession to be a peacemaker and I've helped more people than I've hurt. Wow. I want people to understand that because we, it, listen, every police officer is not bad. And we have to understand as black people, when we see a black police officer, it's not the hookup brother or sister. I have to do my job. You did something wrong. I've, I've took it, taken an oath to do what I'm supposed to do. So I can't give you the hookup. Like I would, you would want me to do something different to a white person, but you want the hookup from me. And like you said, I want people to understand that you are here to bring peace because we are in a heightened time that every police officer is, I hate, I F the police. Like I hate the police, but there are decent police officers out here who are really doing their job. And I just want to make that point because there's a lot of people who are just, oh, look at you. That's a black man arresting black people. Black people, if you do something wrong, you're going to get arrested. Okay, so let's just make that clear. If you do something wrong, you're going to get arrested. Right. So the charges don't have a color. If you break the law, you break the law. That's that's the bottom line. It, you know, so, and uh, you know, this is a little misnomer. White people and Spanish people and Chinese people, they break the law, too. We just see it on TV as, you know, that black guy got arrested, you know, and, and doing it for 25 years. Believe me, I've seen it all. You know, yeah. I've seen it all. So everybody every nationality, every color breaks the law. So we're not exclusive when it comes to that. But we, what we really need to do is we really need to understand that um, it is a job that we took on to help people. So the people who are frustrated and tired of their job, if they can't do it and help people anymore, and if they are in it just to bust heads and, and get, get numbers for the county or for the city, then they really don't they're really not law enforcement officers. They, they're just thugs behind a badge. And a oh. lot of these guys could, can fight. They, 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 they never been in an altercation and they just wanted some, somebody to be able to push around. So they, you know, they become cops, but it, that's the wrong reason to get into law enforcement. You right. know, you, know, you, you want to get into law enforcement to, to make a difference, to help people, you know, community policing is big. And, but we don't, us as black people, we don't get involved in those type of community affairs. You know, here it is. You you see, we used to throw events for um, our black uh, police uh, league and everybody would show out for that because we would be, you know, giving away food and doing all these things. But then when we came to a basketball league and we wanted all of our kids to be there, like six kids would show up. Wow. You know? Wow. So here it is, we're pouring out our hearts, we're pouring out our time, we're pouring out our money for the community, for our community, and, and then they wouldn't show up. But if you throw something with for some free food, but it's, it's, I don't blame them, it's the mentality that has been taught through generation and generation and generation. We need to get back to basics. We need to structure of families. 
We need the structure of grandma ain't shouldn't be going to the club with granddaughter. Oh. You know? I, I mean, that's just truth. We, we can't, we got to get out of those cycles because if we get back to, you know, the, I don't want to say the old days, but if we get back to the structure where God put us in, then we will be all right. Yes. Yes. You can say the old days, like, listen, time, the internet and things have gotten us so off track where, you know, men are not being allowed to lead in the home because there's so many agendas being pushed on black women that, you know, black women are, the, you know, graduating with degrees more than black men and black women are the highest number of entrepreneurs. And we could do all that. But I'm big on us understanding that we're going to get into our next, we're going to segue right into this. I'm big into us honoring our black men as kings and allowing them to lead. So let's talk about the dynamic of carrying oneself as a king. How do, how do we get back to giving our black men that respect? And how do you guys get back to earning that respect as a king? Okay. So a lot of it is, again, my father taught me how to be a man. Right. So if you don't have a man teaching you how to be a man, how can you be a man? Listen, no offense, because I know you got boys, but a woman cannot teach a, bo a, a boy how to become a man. She could be she could teach him how to become a male because that's already something that he is. But he can't become a man being led by a woman. A male is the first gene. A female was taken from the rib and created, right? So the female became, the only reason the difference between us is you have a fetus, the fe, F-E, right? And the male. So that's the only difference between us. So because that difference, we need to take the structure and the lead of, of King. A lot of times though, and this is 90% of urban areas we don't have a male in the home to teach us how to be a king. If there's a male there, they're subservient to their spouse only mm. because of what's going on in today's time. You know, that's just, you know, we had a better family structure in the 40s, in the 50s, in the early 60s until Woodstock, and then it kind of broke apart. We need to get back to those days. I don't care if a man is working at McDonald's. He's still the king of that house. If he's oh. bringing in a million dollars, he's still the king of that house because you can't take up that position as king. Your role is queen. Your role is queen. Your role is king. Take your role and everything will go right in the house. I'm not saying that everything is going to go right in your life, but in your house, it will, which all to the... All, ultimately turns into everything going right in your life, you know? Yeah. But the problem is women today use TikTok or one of these other platforms to say who they are instead of saying, you know, let me, let me really take up the role that I need to play, you know? Oh. But a lot of it's our fault. As men, we don't take our rightful position. Because guess what? We were never told to take our rightful position. So what we need to do is we need to have better platforms where men can understand who they are. So we, yeah. just, had a, we just had a conference, um, our men's conference. And one of the things that we drove home was, I am a king. You know, as grown men, sometimes we still fall back into the everyday mundane type things that, you know, that the world teaches us. But every time I talk to the brothers, I say, good morning, kings, good afternoon, kings, because I want to remind them of who they are and who God has called them to be, you know? And I call yeah. females queens because that's who they are. And I'm, if I'm on Facebook and I see one of my friend's sons or daughters, I say, happy birthday, prince, happy birthday, princess, because that's who they are. God has called us to be kings of our houses, queens of our houses, and princes and princesses of our houses. But if you don't teach them, if you don't, if, you know, the king is like the um, CEO of a company, right? right? And the queen is like the president. 
you you can you can have you can go in this direction, but you always consult your president on what you want to do. Can you preach? You better not. You gonna start preaching today, right? So when you do that, what do you do? You bring that 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 unit together. Not only, but you don't stop there. You go to the kids, which are like the board members. You go to them and tell them why you're doing what you're doing. So they have an understanding of when they see you do this, oh, I, that's why mommy and daddy did this. That's why they bought this car. That's why they bought this house. You know, I told my kids when we bought this house, I'm buying this house for you guys because I didn't want you in a certain environment because I worked there and I didn't want anybody to take actions on you for something that I did. Wow. Right? So I told them that early, you know, when, when, when we moved down here and, you know, you live in the uh, suburbs in a sense, and your kids want to go to everybody's house. I said, you can't go to their house. Why not? Because not just because I said so, but because their parents are alcoholics, their parents do drugs, their parents do this. I explained to them why they're the board. They're, they're going to, they're going to run the company one day. Right. So they need to know why. They just don't need to know no or yes. Why are you taking these actions? Why are you taking these steps to the future? Wow. So I love it because I've known you and Laura and everybody who knows me knows I have my core four, which is Laura, and me, and Gibby. And I've watched you guys from teenagers and I've admired you for a long time. And of course we know nobody has the perfect relationship but I've admired you guys on how you've handled your relationship from the inside. I've never seen scandal. I, I've never heard Laura talk bad about you. And I've been in some relationship where I call her and talk bad about the men like this, I'm about to, but I've never heard her downplay you or downgrade you. And we have conversations, private conversations of I'm going through a little something, but it's never been to demean you or to give me ammunition against you. Mm -hmm. So you've been married for 31 years. Woo. What is the key to the success of your marriage? Come on, tell us, because I need to know. Well, one of the biggest things is what you just said, keeping everything in house, you know, and when you need to go to somebody, you go to the right people. You don't go to the wrong people. So if I'm going through something, I don't go to my boy who's, di who's divorced, got 10 kids and two baby mamas for advice, oh. you know? I go to my boy who's also in marriage, who also has been in a relationship for a long time and ask him, how did he get through this? We get, we, we survive by our testimonies, you know? So I'm not gonna share my testimony, it hurts somebody. But if I share my testimony, it'll help the next brother. And that's what we did. We consulted with people who were in relationships for a long time. My mother, I mean, my, Laura would talk to my mother you know, about me, but that's the best person to go to. They were, they were married until she passed away, right. you know? So, I mean, for, for 50 something years, they were married. That's what you need. That's who you need to go to. Don't go to grandma and ask her, how does she fix her relationship with her husband? Well, how do you fix your relationship with your husband? When grandma has never been in a relationship, she got 10 kids and her, and your mother is, 18 years younger than your, your grandmother and you are 16 years younger than your mother. Mm -hmm. You know, those are not the people to go to, you know, and, and that's just a fact. I don't, I'm not throwing shade on that because that's a reality of our life, but you don't go to those people, especially now you got so many different areas where you can go to yeah. get information. And, and that's one of the reasons why we always stuck to, and we got advice from people who could actually help us and wouldn't be in our business. And one of the worst things, let me tell you, ladies, let me tell you, ladies, one of the worst things in the world to do is talk bad about your man to another woman. Oh. Because the first thing that that woman is going to do, if she's not going to do it herself, she's going to tell another woman. And one of the two of them or three of them or five of them that she tells is going to try to sneak in there and have some pillow talk with your man. Woo! Keep your business I'm... at home. Wow. Listen, sisters, 
I'm sorry. This is and this, like he said. This is no shade. This is just real talk. Real talk. Men hurt too, where men share their truth. I'm sure the experience. You you got to understand. This is somebody talking from experience who runs men's group, who has small groups with men who are are sh really sharing with him the dynamic of things that are going on when they go out and share. Go ahead. I mean, realistically, it's happened to me. You know, I mean, right. listen, okay. I, I was in I was in uniform. You know, I was in the streets, and you know, if I'm hurting in my relationship and women come at me, it's like, oh, you know, it's tempting. It's, it is very right. tempting. However. A lot of men don't know who they are and what their goal is. And if you don't have those type of priorities, then you will go out and you will do stupid things. And believe me, I've done stupid things in my marriage and Laura's done stupid things in our marriage and the kids have done stupid things in our family, but we're still together because God has, God put us together. And we know that anything that God put to, puts together, no man or no woman or no other child could destroy. Wow. See, this is real talk right here. So let's let's do one more little layer because our time is running out because I usually end it at 9.45. So let's talk about why it's so important for you because I see you in community. I see you in, in the church. Why is community so important to you? Why is it so important for you to give back? So one of the reasons why it's so important is because when I grew up in Orange, I ate at everybody's house on my block. It didn't matter what color you were. It didn't matter what religion you were involved in. We just went in your house and we ate. That was a part of the community. And, you know, everything is black and white now, you know, and one of the things that I hate back in the old days, and I keep, I don't want to keep on mentioning this, but it wasn't about color, you know, right. when, when they, the, when the Bible talks about slaves, there just wasn't black people because that's all we see now, because that's all they put on TV, but slaves were everybody, every color, you know, but the same way everybody was slaves, every color was slaves, we also broke bread together. We also were a community, you know? So because we were a community, that's what we need to do now. If we help just one person, you never know where that's gonna lead. One of my guys in my small group, he told me, he says, buddy, he says, I gotta tell you this, you, you were teaching my nephew about some stuff and you know what, this is his first year in college and he's in a Bible study group right now. Mm, and awesome. he's participating in the Bible. I mean, you know, yeah, you can go and say that, hey, listen, I, I attend a Bible studies uh, course because I have to because of my major. But no, he he signed up for it. And he's participating. He's engaged in the conversation because of the two years that I spent with him as a youth to get to the, get him to that point. So as black men, sometimes what we try to overdo is we try to overcompensate. So what we do is we'll take a child, we'll actually try to mentor him from the time he's say 10 years old till the time he's 21. What we need to understand is God brings people in our lives. He takes people out of our lives, let him do his business. But see, sometimes our job is just to water the seed mm. or our job could be just to put light on that seed or to give breath or, or give um, carbon dioxide to that seed so it can grow, you know? So sometimes we have to understand why we're in relationship with that person or those people and then not try to crowd them or choke them when they try to move away. Right. You know, we do that right. to our That's children, true. you know? That's our children true. want to go out and want to do something. We say, no, 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 stay here. Stay in the safety of my arms. And God says, could you please let them go? I have something great for them on the other side. Mm. You know, listen, Yahweh is, is super, super smart. We are super, super dumb compared to him. So we have to mm. understand our roles in life. Our only job is to worship him. Yes. How do we worship him? We worship him by going to work, doing the things that he wants us to do. Staying in community teaching young people how to respect themselves, respect others and grow up and loving God and how to be successful, successful in their careers. And success is measured on a, a large scale. You know, my success might not be your success, but long as we're successful, we're both good, right? I don't need ha to have a multi-million dollar house, a boat and the bends in the driveway to be successful. 
You know, if I'm if I can rock my little Honda Civic and I got family in the house and we're all good, we're sitting around, we're playing games, that's successful to me. You know, everybody mm. comes to my house, they say, buddy, this is a safe haven, you know, and I love that because to me, that's my success. That's my community. I bring people in and I help people. This the, the communications that we have talking and helping people and, and helping families. So Laura and I went to um, to ShopRite yesterday to go buy food for um, Thanksgiving for families. And somebody was saying, man, that's um, a lot of stuff for Thanksgiving. I said, no, we're gonna actually donate all of this food. So they look shocked. Why, right. why aren't more people doing more? If you Ooh. have it, do it. And I don't. we don't have a lot, but we have enough. So if it. we have enough, we can give a little bit more so everybody else, so maybe 10 families could have a box of pasta than instead of one family, you know? Wow. You know, if you wow. can go out and you can spend $100 on a Friday night at the club, I think you can go spend that $100 at this particular time and buy $100 worth of food to give to a couple of different families and help them out. That's community. That's what we used to do, you know? You used to go to the den mother and used to talk to her and you know tell her your problems and she used to give you advice and then used to we used to give food to our families and, and our community and stuff like that and that's what we really need to get back to because if we do that this world will look totally different. Mm, 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 mm. Thank you so much for your time, man. This has been so rich and just rewarding for me. I enjoy doing this because I really feel like our Black men need a voice of positivity. We are so used to focusing on a negative. And like I said, I've watched you. You know, let me just tell you this. Remember when we were younger when you see me, you used to call me Smiley? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, every day, hey, you used to be like, hey, Smiley. And, I, and that, when I'm having like a really bad time, this is how powerful words are. And this was, I had to be about 16. This, 16. Is, this is years and years ago. You're like, hey, Smiley. And I'm like, you know, he called me like, and because I was always smiling. So when I'm in a space where I'm not doing so well, I want you to know that your voice always pops in my head. That Amen. that seed that you watered so many years ago always pops in my head like when I'm not smiling. And I'm like, why do you used to call me smiling? Another person, Norm from BKS1 Radio, he said something about my smile because I was kind of self-conscious about my smile because my teeth are little. And he said, your smile is so inviting to people. Don't ever not smile. So it's so important of words that people pour into you. Like you said, you might be the water or the light or the air. Just remember what you're saying. It, it really resonates with our young people. And I just thank you so much for your service to community. I thank you so much for pouring into our men and your men's group, because that is so important. So I want you to tell people one about your business and then I want you to tell them if they can join the men's group online and how they can do that. Sure. So um, I retired from law enforcement last uh, August. I did 25 years. And so I wanted to get into a security business as most cops do. But God said, no, that is, that's the, close that chapter of the book. I have a new chapter for you. So he made me CEO and president of my own uh, company. It's a real estate investment company. It's called the Kingdom Group. And we have multi facets underneath that umbrella. We have a construction company. We have a photography company. We have a staging company. And we're also getting into a new space, which I'm going to try to release in a few um, what, what we're getting into, you know, the mind is always going. So, yeah. um, so so we have a, a lot of things going. So we, we're invested in real estate. That's where we are. If we can help, and we have done it already since I've been um, involved in this company, we've helped so many families get into rentals, uh, rehabbing the properties and everything. And if you put, uh, and this is key, and this is what I found. If you put a black man in a place where he can call his home, he will feel 10 times better about himself than wow. if you if he's in um, in somebody's raggedy old apartment, where you where you lay your head is big, and if you can really put somebody in a position where they can call themselves a king of that 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 space, 
it's 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 major for them, and that's what I found out. And I and we're doing big things, and I and I, I just is just a scratching the surface of what we're going to do. And um, yeah, we have uh, Facebook, we have Instagram, the Kingdom Group, and um, I'm sure we could put something out there on your um, on yes, your definitely. on your platforms to um, let people know how they can get in touch with us. But um, also, if you want to get um, involved in the men's group, we're getting ready to come out of the semester. Just get in touch with me. My name is Robert Harris, buddy. Everybody knows me by buddy. My number is 973-964-7022. We can hook you up with um, our men's group. We go all year round. They usually have semesters, but we go all year round. But uh, uh, on the books, we have um, semesters. But even off semester, we, we, we still get together. We still talk because it's not a semester thing for, for men. It's a it's a day to day struggle, and if you can save just one life, then you're doing a great job, and that's what we do. We help so many people. We love the brothers, we love the sisters, and we just want to help uh, as many people as we can in multiple ways. You know, if somebody's hungry, most of the time they won't tell you that they're hungry, but if you if they, if you have a, a you have a connection with them, they will say, you know, I have a friend that needs some food. And then that's when you go in and you make sure that that person has what they need, even though you might know that it's for them. It doesn't matter. You just need to right. take care of that need. People, people really need to know that you care about them, you know, and, and that, I think that's what we're doing. Oh, my goodness. I love you so much, buddy. Love you too, Trey. I got to get down there to see you guys because I miss y'all and, you know, all this COVID has separated us. But thank God for the Internet. So, so many people like the Internet is trash. The internet is what you make it. God put, put strategically positioned the internet for us to use it to kingdom build. Right. And so many people use it for the wrong reason. So I thank you for your time and I thank you for your wisdom. And I thank you so much for sharing your wife with the world. She is, a, she is my prayer warrior. And in my darkest hour, she's the first person that I call and lean on. And, and, and she, I just, I love you guys' integrity. I know that I could talk to her and it ain't gonna go nowhere. Like that's like, you know, you need that. That and that and that's what we need. We need more people to share with somebody that you can trust and this and get the right advice, not the wrong advice, because anybody could throw something out there. But it's it's key though. You got to study the word. We are we are products of a manufacturer, right? Just yes. like you get a TV. Most people don't read the manufacturer instructions. We just hang it up on the wall and start pushing buttons. That's what we do as people. God is the manufacturer. Yah is the manufacturer. We are the product. He gave us a blueprint. He gave us a he gave us a guide, which is the Bible. Yes. But most people don't open it up. It just sits on a shelf somewhere. You know, mm. anything that you need is in that book. And I don't want it to call it just a book, but that's what it's called. The real, the, the name of it is called the Sefer. It's the book. It is our legacy. It's the law. It's, it's everything that's in there. And it also leads us to Christ. You know, yeah. you know, I call him Yeshua because I'm, I, I like to use the Hebrew names. But, you know, if you want to say Jesus, because I was saved underneath the name of Jesus. If you want to call him whatever. That is the blueprint. He, he, it's there. Everything is there for us, but we, yeah. of, we have to open it up we and do. read it. And like you said, we get a, a, a product, we get a juicer, a blender, a TV, and we're only using it to half of the capacity because we never took the time to read the manual and there's so much more to it. Like, and we got, we got to get in the word people. And y'all know, I love Jesus. I believe in the father, the son and the Holy spirit. And I'm not trying to shove them down your throat or be so churchy churchy, but he is why I'm sitting here and I don't look like what I've been through. So if you just tuned in, this is men hurt too. We had a fabulous guest, Robert buddy Harris, who has really peeled back the layers of a man. And I appreciate his vulnerability and his authenticity authenticity and just sharing with us. So you guys remember what I tell you at the end of all my broadcast, you deserve the best. Yes, I'm talking to you. You deserve the best. Now go get it. Peace and blessings. And remember Psalm 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Psalm 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Thank you so much, buddy. I love you. Thank and I will you. see you on the other side. Peace. Shalom, people. God bless.